good morning, good afternoon or good evening, depending from which part of the world you're dialing in. Welcome to our uh, presentation today about the importance of a healthier digital world. My name is Clarinda. I'm a CCO at Software Improvement Group. Uh, I'm dialing in from the Netherlands and my co-presenter, Vidya, you're dialing in from New York. Hi, everyone. Hope you're having a good day. Can you tell something about your role? You're a software engineer at Software Improvement Group. Um, the US team. Yeah. yeah, so I'm a software engineer. I'm based in Brooklyn. I live in New York City, but I'm originally uh, from Canada and I've lived in other parts of the world, but my background is in uh, computer engineering and I've had about 15 years of experience, everything from starting off as a developer to a manager and now I'm in consulting. Thanks. Yes, so different than, than, than me, I, I have more, I've, been, I've experienced in the software industry for almost 25 years, I calculated it today, um, and, uh, but I've been more on the business side, so I'm less technical than, uh, than Vijay is, uh, but I've experienced uh, during my whole career actually frustrations, whether it was about uh, building a website and it took so much time or it didn't exactly do what I wanted it to do and not understanding why that was the case, or waiting for our own products that we want to bring to the market. And it took more the time than we anticipated for to create a feature, for example, to launch a module. And yeah, I was always felt a bit frustrated that I did not really understand what was going on and why things are the way they are. So uh, when I find out about uh, something, uh, a company called Software Improvement Group, where we both, uh, where we both work, um, I really got intrigued by this and how, uh, how you can actually measure the health of, uh, of a software application. Um, that's a little bit of a very quick introduction, but I think why we really care about uh, the importance of a healthy digital world, uh, that's something uh, I would like to uh, share with you with a more uh, personal story, actually. Um, let's, let's go to the next uh, slide. Because, um, um, yeah, this brings you back uh, suddenly uh, to the year uh, 1953, to a night uh, in February 1st, there was a massive uh, flood in the Netherlands. Um, and... Um, uh, the black air line that you see on this uh, map is the area that was uh, hit by this flood. Uh, what happened, there was a spring tide and there was an enormous uh, storm and there was also a low pressure. And that uh, together, the result was that uh, the sea level water could raise almost six meters, almost 19 feet above sea level. So that's really, really a big amount and uh, that caused a lot of uh, troubles in this uh, area. Um, you can see the little island where I live, it's uh, with the circle around it, um, that island is called Tolen, and the yellow dot is where I live, it's a, call, a city, small city called Tolen, uh, so the island is called Tolen, but the city as well, and um, uh, the blue dot, that is Stavenisse, and um, what actually happened is uh, my uh, father-in-law, he was standing on the dike in that same night in uh, February 1st, looking at the water raising to serious, scary levels. And at a certain moment, the water dropped inches. And what happened? The dikes broke in Stavenisse. And uh, this short video will uh, show you a little bit about uh, how that looked like. Uh, and the fact that the dike broke on that place yeah, probably is one of the reasons why uh, my, my father-in-law still lives and I met my husband. Uh, but in Stavenisse, it was uh, really, really bad, as amongst other places. About 50% of the population died there. So that's uh, something, of course, the Dutch government never wanted to uh, happen again. And uh, they started this huge investment in building dikes and dams uh, to prevent this from happening again. And one of the biggest dams is actually the Oosterschelde Kering. Uh, this is the Oosterschelde Kering. It's uh, 9K long. Um, and what is uh, special about this is that it uh, is still open. So it allows the water from the North Sea to flow in and out the sea arm, which is called Oosterschelde, and which is a very beautiful uh, nature, actually. There's, uh, it's famous for its oysters and crabs and lobsters, for example. So that is still intact due this, to this special dike. Well, as you I can imagine... Uh, nowadays, everything is about data, and there's a lot of measure, a lot of data being tracked within this dike. Uh, how much water is flowing in and out, the pressure, uh, all those things are measured in systems, in software systems. And based on those systems, the ministry that's responsible for this decides whether or not to close the dam. So the dam can be closed in a moment when there's a risk. So it's super important that those systems are reliable and, of course, also secure. But uh, and this is something that uh, Software Improvement Group is uh, is monitoring. Um, 
So I guess this is uh, my personal main story why I uh, I joined SIG because I think this is really important and this is an example of uh, nature and uh, things can happen. But you know, probably some of you uh, attending uh, have children and you see how children are acting with technology on a daily basis, not really knowing whether they can trust it or not. So um, maybe we can go to the next slide. Uh, Vitya and I, we both stepped forward uh, as being part of Software Improvement Group to uh, to tell our story here today. Um, this is not a promo talk necessarily about uh, SIG, but I do think it's important that you uh, you know that this is a company that exists already for more than 20 years. Uh, out of the Netherlands originally, but nowadays we have also uh, uh, entities in, uh, in the Nordic, in Belgium, and of course in uh, New York, the UK, and the German region. Um, we're going to talk about how you can measure software health in a moment, but I'm actually really curious, uh, Vitya, what is your story? Why did you join SIG? Yeah, absolutely. So, Clarinda, you mentioned that uh, you, when you uh, joined the software institute, that before you joined, you were quite frustrated about um, software is being software being delayed and not being delivered, and, and pushed out to um, uh, our customers. And I was the person behind the scenes <laughs> as a developer, <laughs> causing those delays. And uh, and I know all about the frustration, creating a lot of technical debt, and um, I know a lot about the frustrations on being. And that I became a manager, and so I. Um, know what it's like to be on both sides um, and that was actually one of the reasons so previously before I worked here I worked for a, um, a global nonprofit around for teachers and um, um, uh, and teachers and educators around the world in underserved uh, communities and just a lack of resources and um, how we can use technology for something better and something good uh, was always close to my heart and but looking at quality and how do we do this in a good way was something that was very personal for my career. So that's how I looked at SIG and I joined SIG because um, I've, I understand your frustrations all too well. <laughs> but um, we cool. can take it. So yeah. yeah, and in this, um, if you want to share a little bit more about yeah. um, how we measure, that'd be great. And then I can uh, dive deeper into yeah, it. Let's do that. Process. Let's uh, let's move on. Um, what you will see on the next slide is an iceberg, and this iceberg represents uh, basically an application. And the top of the iceberg is the software part that we all interact with, right? It's the functionality, the user experience. But what you don't see is what's underneath the what's underneath the water, and that is where the real complexity is. The architecture, the, everything is underneath. You don't see it. And what SRG does is this is what we make transparent, and we do this by. Um, using the ISO 25010 standard. And what we did ourselves is behind the different aspects of this uh, standard, um, we created our own measurements. So for example, for maintainability, we created our own uh, model behind it so that we can actually measure, if we take the entire code of an application, we can measure how healthy it is. So we look at uh, the complexity of, uh, of the code, the entanglement with other uh, elements, the code unit size, all those things we can measure and based upon that decide or make, an, uh, make it explicit and uh, what is good code and what is where you may should make changes to make it uh, easier to maintain in the example of maintainability, same for security, reliability, and so on. Um, because what you don't want indeed is that you have the whole iceberg on top of your shoulders, basically, if you need to make changes or updates. So that's really why it's so important to uh, to keep what's under the surface basically in control. And that's what we are we are here for. Um, but maybe uh, Vitya, you can, uh, can take a little bit more deeper dive in how healthy software should look like. Absolutely. So I'll start a little bit about how what does healthy software look like, and also I'll touch about how do we trust the technologies that our life, lives depend on, and how do we know when something's good enough, and should we aim for perfection? And finally, I'll discuss a little bit about um, how developers can identify problems early on to improve the digital health of their um, system. So before I get into that, I wanted to start with what does healthy software look like? So we take a data-driven benchmark approach uh, to help answer this question. The chart that you're seeing on your screen is our benchmark data of all the systems that uh, Software Improvement Group has analyzed since the early 2000s. And so far, we've analyzed about 7,500 enterprise software systems, totaling about 70 billion lines of code. And it comprises a, a variety of different technologies, over 300 of them. And so each white dot you're seeing represents a system that's been analyzed. And uh, we measure, monitor, and capture the essential relationship between 
the system's um, technical attributes and its build quality in relation to the overall industry standard. So this is how we can measure against industry standard whether or not how healthy your software is. So again, here what you're seeing is that a, a typical trend we see is that um, as the volume of a system goes up, the quality of the system goes down. So when you see that downward um, trend that's going on, that's typically because larger systems tend to be very complex and harder to maintain. And this has a direct correlation to the number of defects that can be found in a system. So this type of benchmark data will generally help people in uh, assessing the health of their system and identify issues early on. And next I'll talk a little bit about why um, build quality matters. So the first is cost of ownership. What you're seeing on the yellow uh, bars here is that we found that um, a lower cost uh, or a, a system that has a four-star system, uh, which we consider a higher maintainability or build quality, is usually generally it costs two times lower to, or to maintain that system than a two-star system. And a four, and it's four times lower when compared to a five-star system to a one-star system. And the next is the speed of development, and that's in the gray bars that you're seeing, which is we found that development takes four times faster in a four-star system than in a two-star system, and it's more than 10 times faster in a five-star system when compared to a one-star system. So the higher quality systems, obviously, will have shorter defect resolution time, and it's just overall important for um, the business goals of our organization. And if you, if you look at those stars rating, oh, now I hear myself twice. I don't know why that is, but. Oh, I can hear you fine. Oh, can you hear me normally? Okay, yeah, good, yeah. good. Um, those stars that you have here and also the previous slide, how does it exactly work? I guess it's related with the benchmark that you just showed. Ah, yes, that's right. Um, so, so we measure, so when we, uh, I meant, mentioned about looking at healthy systems, so there are things in a system that are, that you can actually measure in the code base. So we look, call them quality attributes. So we, we measure that across a variety of quality attributes within the system to tell if, whether or not a system is healthy and if it works effectively. And we aggregate those measurements and typically we, we put them in a rating scale um, based on that benchmark data set that I showed you earlier. And we, to make it simpler for everyone to understand at, at a very high level, 30,000 feet level, um, what the system looks like. So then we give it a one star or five star rating. And that's where you get that bell curve. So it sounds like a little bit like a standard. And I know there is no real software standards for quality yet, except I think in the US nowadays, it's mandatory to uh, demonstrate if you deliver software to a government, um, the bill of material, software bill of material in terms of open source libraries that you use. I don't you think it would be a good idea to do that for every aspect basically of software? Yeah, absolutely. I believe so. So when you think about this, software is just ubiquitous now everywhere. It's used everywhere. And in my opinion, any industry that develops complex products uh, and has such far reaching impacts should be using metrics to ensure quality and service. So today, can you, it would be unthinkable to not have strict quality measurements and governance in automotive or manufacturing industries. So in that sense, I think the software industry is lagging far behind. Um, technology is changing so fast and the systems are getting more and more complex. So I do think this would be beneficial um, to our end user, really, whether it's a customer of a software products or tax paying citizens of the country relying on software systems. And tying that back to what you were saying uh, earlier, Clarence, uh, about the Dutch Ministry of Infrastructure and Waterworks, I know that you worked with them um, for a bit. Can you share a little bit about that? Sure. Um... Yeah, what was maybe nice to mention, we can go to uh, perhaps the next slide indeed, that uh, last year I, uh, I had a meeting with uh, Peter Den Held. Uh, he was the Director of Development uh, Services at uh, Rijkswaterstaat, we say in Dutch, but it's indeed the Ministry of Infrastructure and Waterworks. And they basically own the entire infrastructure of the Netherlands, so whether it's highways, tunnels, dikes, bridges, everything. And they're in a transformation from becoming a much more data-driven uh, organization. Um, so they really need to be able to rely on the software that, uh, that, that captures that data and based upon what they make decisions. Uh, so, for example, uh, if a bridge closes too fast or uh, that can be of serious impact. So they need to be able that they can trust that if ever uh, in the past there was someone sitting next to a bridge opening it manually, 
Now they do it on a 100k distance, for example, and that they have an accurate, accurate view of what's happening at that moment in time. So for them, it's really important that their mission critical systems are being uh, monitored on, uh, on quality, not just on build quality, but also on the architecture and security. Uh, you can imagine security is also a very important aspect in these kinds of uh, assets that we're talking about. So that's a little bit of story what I know about uh, Rijkswaterstaat. Ah, that's great to hear. Yeah, and one of the things that uh, we helped them at also um, is with their supplier management. So they have a lot of suppliers that build their software systems along with their in-house teams. So, so by using these standards, we specifically help make them make it mandatory for their software suppliers to meet SIG standards of the four-star quality build. And it helped the organization ensure that if there was any transfer of software from the supplier to the organization, they had it was a high standard and that they were getting tr reliable, trustworthy software. Um, this also helped their development teams inherit a secure and highly maintainable software system so they can focus on building features and innovation. Hey, and I think we also helped them, uh, what was it, the end of uh, 2021 when this uh, Log4j vulnerability uh, was uh, popping up everywhere. Do you know what we exactly did there? Yeah, absolutely. That was a very important um, period. Uh, be, uh, and just to give you some context there, our benchmark data actually shows that over now over 80% or more of modern application code is um, sourced from third-party open source software components. So the reuse of already built libraries and capabilities provides such a major productivity benefit, but it also comes with a lot of vulnerabilities so it, and risks of using that. So one of those examples in a long series of these actually uh, is Log4j. Log4j just happened to be about very public. Um, and so we were able to identify that early on because we, along with software quality build, we also monitor security and open source health. And we were able to identify that early on and we notified Peter's team along with a thousand other uh, client systems. And, and they were able to resolve their vulnerabilities quickly and also reduce any potential incidents that might've happened. So I can actually share a clip of what they, how they monitor their system. So this is a um, screenshot of just what um, they're, so obviously because of our non-disclosure uh, uh, agreements, I can't share their systems, but this is our systems. We also do measurements on open source um, software. So uh, what it looks like, so from an open source health, uh, we have one of our modules, we scan all open source and third-party libraries within a code base, and we look for any risks pertaining to security, license usage, freshness, um, activity, and the stability and overall dependency management. So most importantly, it highlights any, uh, any risks and opportunities so they can take action on it. So, and we highlight that in these um, rating systems, but also these color code, um, the coding systems that you see here. And I'll share, we also look at security of um, a code base, and this is security of the overall system, we look at the technology risk as well, whether or not the technologies are modern and up to date. And then of course, we look at the overall maintainability of system. And this is a suite of systems that allows you to get a 30,000 view, feet view, and also we drill down to code level view very quickly. And it, this looks really cool, but I see in the previous slides as well, I saw a lot of reds and here I see five stars, that means dark, green and in this case majority is not on five stars what should you aim for should you always aim for solving all the red uh, alerts and uh, aim for five stars ah yeah that's we get that uh, question quite often so it's uh, we, want, we want to focus on things that you care about and to keep you awake at night so not everything so we typically advise companies to identify which applications are business critical and which applications are high risk, such as ones that are public facing or integrate with a lot of external applications over standalone. And also we look at the severity of impact and the likelihood of a risk occurring. And then we also take a look at combination of other characteristics, like how, how frequently is code being developed on that application? What's the life cycle of the application? If it's an older system that has thousands of uh, person years of development, it'll be much harder to get to a, say, four-star quality, quality rating. If it's a newer application built in modern technologies, then it's uh, advisable to aim for, say, four or five stars. So what you're seeing on this a dashboard is sort of the overall, you know, perfect five-star software systems, but that's unrealistic in most cases. 
Hey, and, and you worked on both sides, uh, software that was very healthy, software that was less uh, healthy, perhaps. What do you prefer? Oh, yeah, <laughs> that's a very easy question to answer. <laughs> prefer uh, healthier software, mainly because then, oops, let me go to the... then uh, I don't have to uh, you know, stay awake at night wondering <laughs> whether I've built that quality software or having to manage it the next day. So instead, I'd rather be on a beach in Jamaica, like in that photo it was, um, uh, and uh, enjoy my time. This is also reflecting a bit, I think, the values of SIG, right? I think uh, we have a culture where people intend to help each other work hard to make it happen for our clients. And therefore, we also need to have time to relax and enjoy life a bit. Uh, other core values I think are important to share, apart from what you already saw today, is uh, fact-based instead of opinion-based. We want to measure it, and based on actual measurements, we will hand out uh, recommendations and uh, identify risks, for example. Um, but also, uh, our independence is very dear to heart. We want to be able to be honest in what we measure and uh, that no one can ever accuse us of creating our own work. We never will solve and we never do the work to modify the systems ourselves. That's something we leave to the teams themselves or to third parties. Um, and something else that's important to us is that we respectfulness and integrity. And in terms for uh, uh, diversity, which I see a little bit as a link of uh, Respectfulness, of course, is we still have a little bit of work to do in terms of diversity between male and female. So I really hope that uh, today we have inspired maybe some of you to uh, to join our forces. Um, so let's have uh, let's have a look. Uh, that's my last slide that I think is nice to share. Um, join our forces. Of course, you can do that by joining our company or becoming a partner. Uh, therefore, uh, please visit us uh, on our uh, in our virtual virtual booth uh, after this presentation if you're interested in that. If you want to learn more about the models and do a little bit deeper dive, definitely join Vijay's talk tomorrow. Vijay, which which time is your talk? Yeah, it's nine uh, nine after ten past nine uh, Eastern time. And your yeah. title of the presentation is. So it's about architecture. So and how to build maintainable architectures. So I'll get go into a little bit uh, into the we just touched upon at a high level today, but I'll get into more details on how someone can look at using measurements to build maintainable architectures. Yeah, exactly. Hey, and if you are in development yourself already, or you are a manager of an IT organization, you can start working with these principles already as of today, right? You don't need to join our company. You can do this today out of your own organization. So if you're a developer, embrace clean code guidelines for yourself or for with your whole team. And as a manager, of course, you have the, the power basically to implement a governance structure to measure build quality across your whole portfolio, so to say. Um, last but not least, if you have no time to join one of our other sessions, please scan the QR code and join us on our SIG symposium where we will launch our latest benchmark report, um, where we will share uh, results that we saw in our trends that we see in our benchmark with the community. And after joining the symposium where we do the official launch, um, you will also receive a copy. And with that, I think we went three minutes over time, but uh, I really hope you enjoyed our talk. And please feel free to visit it on our booth or uh, check us on LinkedIn, for example. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Thank you.